welcome. So we have 25 minutes to talk about freedom, safety, how the future of smart cities and autonomous driving is going to be impacted by technology and what that means in terms of our own sort of life choices, liberty and so forth. Uh, briefly, Simon Levine, I'm a venture capitalist at Mosaic Ventures. We focus on uh, Series A investing across Europe and I should say I'm a, an investor in Nexar, one of the companies here on stage. Perhaps you can introduce yourself, Josh, too. Josh Moore, managing partner at Husk Ventures. Uh, we're also investors in Nexar. I ran Uber New York for about five and a half years prior to that. Um, Bruno Fernandez, I'm an advocate of data, also CTO of Nexar and um, uh, one of the co founders. So, just to sort of roll right into this, you know, one of the things that often gets discussed is how quickly will autonomous driving arrive? And there's lots of estimates that have been put forward in the market. You know, perhaps, Josh, you, you know, from your Uber experience, where there's obviously been lots yeah. of internal debate, what, what's the view there in terms of the range of dates that we can start to see autonomous driving yeah. arrive? It's a really good question. I think in the, in the US, it'll vary by city and how the governments and, and regulators sort of see it. I think in places like the West Coast, the desert, where it's sunny and clear 360 days a year, you'll probably see it sooner than in Manhattan. But what people don't, I think, always think about is that this isn't going to be a big reveal where all of a sudden we wake up one day and we see autonomous out there. Our, our cars already have uh, features that are semi-autonomous, controlling speed based on the uh, vehicle in, in, in front of us, lane management, things like that. So I think in some ways we're already there today. Uh, in Manhattan, maybe t 10 or 20 years, but I think Bruno would probably know better. So, so there's different levels of autonomous, and we should probably sp spend just 30 seconds on that. There's famously sort of five levels of autonomous, and you know, today we're at sort of level two, three, you know, the chap that lost his life on the Florida highway driving into a, a, the side of a truck was, it was in a cruise control mode in his Tesla trying level three, which didn't work so well, unfortunately, tragically for him. But uh, you know, Bruno, what, what's the kind of next of view on when we can start to see level four, level five uh, in the market? Not necessarily pervasively, but in a, in a mixed environment, perhaps. Right. And if you can give us a date, that would be even f more fantastic. A date? Yeah, I think it's uh, January 24th, 2019. Um, uh, seriously, I think level four automation, which you know, for folks who do, do not know about it, is, is really when cars drive in safe environments that are actually not in advance. We think it's still, uh, we'll see cars on the road probably in the next couple of years that actually come. There's actually a, a, a Testing that. Testing that. There's a trial going on in Chicago right now, so it's not like it's unknown. Now, for that to become mainstream, uh, we think it's really decades away, right? Um, we, even level five, which is the next one in an environment, is definitely multiple decades away. So, so several decades away, you know, just by context, you know, how long did it take for cars to get penetrated into the population or ADAS to get penetrated? Maybe you can sort of help frame that. Uh, yeah, you... I, that that's an amazing, so we, you know, we came from search advertising into the space. We didn't know much about autonomous cars. We just thought like, you know, a lot of data will help. And one of the things we learned is like Mercedes-Benz, for example, launched the first car, built the first car in 1886. It took 82 years until 1968 for the US to have 50% of car, 50% of the households to have cars. So that's definitely not exponential. Like some people are saying now, hey, we'll put autonomous cars and it will come. If you, know, you look at more recently, autonomous drive, even adaptive cruise control, launched by Mercedes-Benz again in 2002. If you look at 2015, you know, 13 years later, that was still 2% penetration. You look in the market, it's still 2% penetration adaptive cruise control. So it's very interesting when I talk to you guys as VCs and I go around and go like, hey, it's a solved problem. We go like, oh, by no stretch of imagination, cars do not have these today and they will not have for decades to come. So, so to summarize the sort of view here, we heard it both from Josh, the Uber Tusk view, and Bruno at Nexar is multiple decades before autonomous driving becomes pervasive and we can kind of give up the steering wheel. And I guess in the meantime, what we're saying is there'll be 
some kind of mixed fleet on the road or heterogeneous vehicle population? Is that... That that's next our key assumption about how we design the company is let's not wait decades for that to come. Let's start actually creating a hybrid environment between humans and cars, uh, autonomous cars. If you look at autonomous cars, one of the issues they have is like you know you come to an intersection and there is a human driving another car. How do I, how does the autonomous car tell the human driver that eye contact you and I have when we're driving? It's like yeah, I want to go, I don't want to go. You let the pedestrian go. You you kind of move your hand. You flash the lights. All those things we do. Humans, cars cannot do it. So you need something else. That's what Nexar is. It's a network that connects the cars so that whether it's a human on the wheel or it's an autonomous car in the car, you can actually start solving autonomy now. And so just to put that in context, I think there are a billion plus cars on the road today worldwide. The fleet is getting renewed at, you know, there's maybe 70 million plus new cars each year. So just to cycle through what's there is already a 15 to 20 year replacement cycle. And we're saying that given that not every car today is autonomous that's being put out on the road, many decades. Um, so, but I, I, guess, I mean, I feel like I should stop you there. I, I think will, you know, 100% of the cars be autonomous in Helsinki in five years or 10, maybe not for 100%, for it to be perhaps even illegal to drive your own car decades away, I agree. But I think it's going to be much sooner uh, to this hybrid world where trucks going across long journeys are going to be driving themselves, where there is an Uber, Lyft, et cetera, option for autonomous driving. Some of these services are already piloting this. Um, you'll start to see humans getting less involved right now. There are certain cities where you can re request an Uber and a car, an autonomous vehicle with a sort of a safety engineer in the driver's seat will pull up. I think over time that person maybe leaves and it's monitored remotely or they're shifting to a different seat. Uh, I think you will see those kind of changes where it'll be possible for everyone here to have the experience of an autonomous trip within five years. Um, I think it's further away to a complete autonomous Jetsons type society. Uh, maybe um, the, the open road environment, I think I would agree, right? If you, if you look into what automotive car manufacturers are doing today, what is in the road, what is in the pipeline, driving in a freeway, driving at daytime, driving in the sunshine, driving a truck, platooning use cases for trucks, those are going to be solved in the next five years. Driving in an urban environment with snow, with fog, um, you know, Finns here, for example, when they take a driving test, they actually need to drive in the snow and sleep the car. That, that, there's no autonomous car that's going to be able to drive in Finland in the snow for decades. So, so I have an iPad here with questions from the audience. I encourage you to, to, to prompt me like this. But someone's saying, why do we need autonomous cars really? So what, what, what is the raison d'etre? Is it safety? Is it because we're lazy and we want to be watching a movie? You know, what, what is the reason that autonomous cars are important? So, you, so I'll do the productivity. You know, we are wasting, you know, billions of hours in cars for commutes. I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but people spend a lot of time commuting. I think we can all sort of agree to that. Uh, and if you could repurpose that time to be productive to be able to really engage in conversation, to get work done, to watch a movie, whatever, that's a, that's a huge benefit to society, um, which I think is probably the second most important thing. The first most important thing is uh, safety, really. So, so next are the, the reason we created a company was actually saving lives. And it came, we came to the realization there are about 1.2 million people that die on the road every year. We, we drive as a community 10 trillion miles, and there are 1.2 million miles. Sorry, 1.2 million people that die on the road. The cost to society per death is $2 million. So you start multiplying those numbers, you go like, be, beyond the personal drama that it represents, it's a huge cost to, to the economy. So two, three trillion dollars of exactly. cost. So that's... So, a, a, few, a few percent of world GDP each year we're losing on the roads and then, unnecessarily. And it's preventable, which is the, the thing that I think drives us as Nexar and many other companies to really try and solve the problem. You actually see that the technology, the computer vision technology and the radar technology 
the artificial intelligence required to solve this problem is available now. So yeah, you could be very, very cautious to wait decades to roll it out or start rolling it out progressively and start saving lives now. And so that was the, the mission of Nexar, why you co-founded the company. Can you just spend maybe 30 seconds telling the audience a little more about what that instantiates itself into today and the roadmap for the company going forward? So th the best way to look at our company is if you go to New York, for example, we have you know, a large number of Uber, Lyfts, Junos, Get, you know, so, all so the cars. How many cars on the driving. street on any given day are using uh, Nexo? In, in a good roughly. day, there are probably about five, 6,000 cars in New York that are okay. equipped with this, which is roughly about 2% of all the hours of driving. What this does is what you're driving. Right? What we're trying to do is these cars to be connected to each other. So the humans can talk to other humans. In this case, the computers talk to other computers. When they drive around, they're issuing warnings. So right now, we're getting tens of millions of warnings that as people drive, they're actually getting those warnings. Hey, there's something that is 15 seconds ahead of you. And that's actually really critical, because other technologies that can help you, like a radar, a lighter, again, what you find in a Mercedes-Benz, what you find in a BMW, what you find in Tesla even, has a range as, as far as the camera goes. You could go 150 meters, maybe even 200 meters, right, which is really far. But in an urban environment, you're blocked. You have a car in front of you. There's, there's maybe a pedestrian crossing. You don't see it. That's exactly where we're trying to get to. And that's the world that you can experience already today as an Uber driver in New York. So it's a kind of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle mesh overlay network, kind of like air traffic control that's augmenting the driving experience for those Uber and Lyft drivers, is that correct? It is correct, exactly. It's air traffic control, but imagine, you know, uh, you know there were 10,000 airplanes in the air at any point in time. So right now, you know, you look over at the sky, it's 10,000 planes. On the road, at any point in time, there are 250 million cars. So air traffic control is centralized. You can centralize it. What well, we're trying to build is a decentralized, cooperative overlay between these cars actually regulating the traffic, regulating safety. And so, you know, at what degree of penetration do we start to think that there will be safety benefits and how big do those have to be for it to make a difference? In, in our world, with, because, you know, so the answer would be if you were trying to just do DSR, uh, what is called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology or Wi-Fi, which is the approach that the regulators in the US and Europe have tried for many years, you would really require 25, 30% penetration, which is very, very high. So it's a lot of people have got to it's, cooperate. And, and it's a lot of time. It's, yeah. it's, it's a lot of money, a lot of time, right? So that's, you know, there are studies that say it's a cost to the US economy alone, about $200 billion over a 40-year period. Um, it's about $2.7 to $3 billion per year at the peak of 2023. And actually, it takes seven to eight years for that 30% to happen. Now, our approach at Nexar has been V2V is just part of a solution. It's not the solution. You need camera. You need other sensors to actually help you. When you do that, and vehicle to vehicle, over cellular, with a camera, with all these things that are available in your phone that everybody has, we've seen that at 1.5%, 2%, that's 10 times less in terms of percentage. Right. We start seeing that vehicle to vehicle actually has impacts in preventing collisions. And we measure it. We have 25% recorded less collisions on people who are exposed to these than people who drive in a control bucket. And Josh, when you were managing the Uber fleet in New York, obviously you know, 5,000 drivers a day using Nexar, was it a popular product with the drivers? Was it, did, did they feel safer in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, I, I mean, so just to back up what the, what the product is that drivers are putting in their car is on a phone, a little video camera. So the reason that the penetration can be low but still have that outsized impact is because from that screen, it can see all the cars on the road. So you're not just getting the vehicle that it's in, but also anything that, that, that's, that's within line of sight. The safety benefits uh, are not theoretical. The insurance companies that New York City Uber and Lyft drivers have to buy insurance from, which can run four or $5,000 a year, we're getting 10% off just for using this product because the insurance companies right away saw that this had a tangible impact on, on risk and they priced it accordingly. So drivers were thrilled. It gave them the security of having the camera running so if there's an accident, there's some kind of evidence, but also the insurance companies saw that 
they understood the technology and the benefit and the kind of alerts that drivers could get, which could ultimately keep everybody safer and were willing to reduce the rates because of it. Okay. So the title of this panel was Freedom or Safety. And what we've heard the two of you say is, if we can build an autonomous coexisting fleet, we should be able to prevent many of those 1.2 million deaths and you know, countless other accidents, maiming and injury, property damage and so forth. So that's the payoff. The cost is quote unquote freedom. And so there's different parts of that, but we should try and unpack it for the audience because there is a, a moral or ethical element to this discussion. Uh, and in particular, if you're putting all these cameras real time, creating an overlay that ultimately is uh, creating a kind of digital representation of the public space in real time, there's a privacy issue. Let's, so why don't we spend a few minutes just on that question? You know, fr from an Uber perspective, from a Nexar perspective, how do you think about privacy and who owns the data? So I don't work at Uber anymore, and I'm not going to speak for them. I, I think in, in society, there are trade-offs that we implicitly make. You were, you were saying this yesterday when we met. You know, We have to drive on on roads and stop when the light is uh, red and start when the light is green. These are sort of, uh, these are We give up that liberty freedom. just to go yeah, through the red light. I can't light. just drive anywhere I want. I have to obey traffic signals. They're sort of these societal norms that all existed when we were born, and so we sort of accept them. Uh, you know, I think the, the trade-off will be easy, saving lives for a little bit of freedom that says, for example, you can imagine when my car pulls into a stoplight, I lose control for a second, it sort of, you know, uh, locks me down, or I'm just sort of making this up, but it controls when I do the turn, or it tells me when something is coming. Those will be worthwhile trade-offs, and I don't think, uh, that to me seems like a no-brainer. And, and Bruno, the way that we, we at Nexar have thought about things, is the data owned by governments? Is it owned by the users themselves? Is it some kind of shared entity? Uh, our model is the data is owned by the users. And from the very beginning, you know, it's true we had a governance approach to us. Uh, can we share the data with them, whether it's for enforcement or any other purposes? And our policy has been very clear. We do not. The data is owned by the user, and that's it. Um, but the issue. I think it's more profound than that, right? Is we can now extract out of the data things like what are the traffic signs, what are the parking spots, how many counts of people are. If you know somebody came to the company, could actually start extracting faces and license plates and, and recreate your whereabouts. So I think the, the more fundamental question to us as Nexar is how do we want to do that? Do we want to let the governments run these things for us? I'd be looking at UK, right, in London today. The three to five million cameras on the road. It, we're already living in the panopticon in London. We just don't know it, ultimately. So, yeah. so the question is whether you want to be the governments that actually run that, and who controls the governments, or are you OK that is an environment where it's open, where users actually have access to the data themselves. They can use it to defend their civil liberties. And we had a few cases actually in the US with you know, the police, the cops, stopping some of our drivers at a traffic light after doing what is called a California roll. And the drivers say, well, here's the footage, demonstration that I haven't done it. So to a degree, what feels like it could be a bad side effect, actually, I think for the people who truly care about their civil liberties, it tends to be actually a good thing. So transparency empowers citizens or empowers non-governmental entities to provide a record of exactly what happened. OK. The, what about sort of folks who kind of think about their car as a symbol of liberty and kind of driving down the desert highway? You know, is that something that our grandchildren are going to enjoy? Or instead, they'll be reading a book and uh, catching up on Wikipedia instead? I sure hope they don't have to drive. I have a three-year-old. I've basically made a bet that she'll never have to learn how to drive. And I think, I think I'll, I'll probably be, be right about that. Um, and certainly as a parent, that's sort of a, a wish of mine. That's an incredibly dangerous situation when young people uh, learn how to drive and they go out. So to avoid that you know, entirely, I think, would be a, a really great outcome. 
And, and let's assume that your daughter never does have to drive. One of the questions we have from the audience is her car that an algorithm is driving with a network overlay provided by Nexar or someone else has an accident. Who, who's responsible for that? From a legal perspective, from a moral perspective, is it the algorithm that was driving the car? Well, I think I'd have to know more about the accident. My, you know, as long as she's okay, I guess I don't really care. Um, but as far as the like general sense of wh whose fault is it, it's not always easy to ascribe fault in accidents of today. And I think there'll be a case by case. I think there's sort of a myth about what will the car decide? Will it hit the old people or the young people? That's not really how it works. Um, there will certainly be malfunctions. In the idea of the, the Tesla accident that you mentioned at the beginning, yeah. a white truck sort of pulled in. I don't know all the details, but I know that it was white and the, and the sensors didn't quite Could understand see that it that against was, the horizon. Yeah, yeah, and so that's a bug. And uh, in that case, at, at, at the same time, the driver was not uh, using the autopilot the way that it was supposed to be used. You're supposed to be alert and sort of hands on the wheel. And so I don't know, but I think it'll be case by case. Um, what I do know is I'd rather trust machines, even if they make mistakes, when they're ready for prime time, I'd rather trust the machine than everyone's sort of own fault and falling asleep and being drunk well, and being distracted and all those things. Yeah, so in the aggregate, the world will be a better place. Um, just one or two other questions. We have a few minutes before we have to wrap up. You know, from Tero, asks, who will own the, the, the data and the platform? Is this another kind of Google, Am, Apple, Amazon network effect? You know, how, how do citizens or the public at large feel that their side is being fought for? Right, so uh, as, as I mentioned at Nexar, we, all the data that people record belongs to those people. Uh, what we are saying is we would like to use the data to develop autonomous drive technology. We use the data to learn the algorithms, but we do not actually use the data for any other purpose. Um, if we were to provide the data to an insurance company, it would be, for example, because you, as, as the person driving, says, like, I want to benefit, like in New York, right? I want to get a 10% discount. They, is you who opts in into, hey, Nexar, can you please share my data with the insurer so I can get a discount? But we are not going around and sharing the data. Uh, the only artifact that we create is really the one that generates safety and generates welfare in our society by removing those lives that cost $2 million each. Going back to how we started the conversation, at what level of kind of density do we start to believe that those lives are going to be saved? Are we there at 3 4% in New York in the next year? Is that already going to have an impact on road safety in the city? I think the wow factor will happen in New York uh, within the next 6 to 12 months when we will have a car every minute, a car every 200 meters, a car in every intersection all the time. And when you come to make a left turn, you come to make a right turn, you don't know whether there is a pedestrian or there is a car, and we can warn you. That war the first time that somebody gets that warning, they'll go like, wow, I couldn't see across the corner. I couldn't see there was something behind that truck. So the point is, it's not a theoretical discussion it's about 12 many, months. Yeah, this is in the next 6, 12 months. And hopefully that saves lives. I'm trying to think if... Uh, there's anything more that we can add to that? Should everyone download the Nexar app on their phone right now? They should feel free to do so. They should feel it's free to do so. Publicly available in any market. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Josh from thank Task, you. Bruno from Nexar. Really appreciate being here on the slush stage. This thank is a real you. fire. It's actually hot. I just thought everyone would. Oh. <laughs>